Good morning, everyone. Um, hope you are all doing well um, after this past very difficult, traumatic week. Um, so I, I would like to take today's class time for my data analytics in Power Systems class to talk about what happened in um, the week-long blackout that we had. And I, my goal is to present some data and facts that I find uh, online and in uh, legitimate uh, sources and share some initial thoughts on that. As you all know, it's still an ongoing investigation and more data and more information um, is gonna appear later on, but uh, I'm just trying to um, um, like take this time and um, try to answer questions or um, share my views uh, from the electrical engineering's point, uh, point of view. Okay, uh, I think, uh, uh, is the volume okay for, for us? Uh, I'm trying to, I'll try to turn it on. Um, okay, I'll try to speak louder as well. Thank you. Okay, so, uh, again, this is mostly my uh, point of view. I uh, I'm very grateful to have uh, Dr. Ross Bardick, who is an ECE amateurist professor. Some of uh, you know him as well, so he has shared uh, like um, gave me a lot of good feedback on the slides here. I also benefited from discussions on Power Glo uh, Globe, which is international platform for power engineers. So. Uh, I, I hope that this uh, has some uh, um, sh uh, uh, um, is also uh, the, uh, the opinions by a lot of power engineers in the industry. Uh, is the audio still? Okay, uh, thank you. So um, yeah, let me get started. So we had a winter storm starting from Saturday, February 13, and it's a very, very extreme uh, cold weather. And we knew that it was record long freezing temperature and record level of snowfall. So it has significantly affected all of our infrastructure. Um, we had lost power for days for a lot of uh, uh, citizens and also business in the state of Texas. And as you can see that during the peak hour, uh, peak uh, outage time, almost like 50% of uh, homes have lost power. So, uh, and in particular, it has affected a heavily populated area in Texas, which is very traumatic. It has also affected water delivery systems um, for reasons uh, due to power outage in water uh, processing plants and water quality issues. And uh, also due to the fact that uh, water pipe bursts and um, other infrastructure failures uh, during this cold condition. We have also witnessed, uh, witnessed gas shortages and spi uh, the spikes of gas price in uh, the uh, Texas area as well. So there was a state of emergency uh, declared. So uh, with that, I would want to re visit the timeline for during this storm before and after the storm. Um, so uh, around a week uh, before uh, the storm came, meteorologists have uh, known about that and to show that with uh, general public and also cognizant parties. In particular, ERCOT, Electric Reliability Council of Texas, has, uh, when they became aware of the storm, they have ensured notice advisory and watch for this expected uh, extreme cold weather condition a week before that. So they, especially uh, in particular on February 11, they have announced this um, uh, extreme uh, peak uh, electricity use condition. And they predicted that the peak is gonna come on Monday morning, um, the morning of, uh, in the morning of February 15. So they asked the generators to uh, take necessary steps to prepare the facilities. 
and look into few supplies and plant outages because some of generators uh, have scheduled their outage for maintenance uh, during the winter time. We, we will talk a little bit more about that later. And they ask them to do whatever they can do for winter weatherization as well. So on Thursday, there were also some local utility uh, outages due to like freezing temperature, icy, uh, icy, icy uh, uh, temperature. A lot of trees have that issue and also the distribution lines. So the utilities were actively restoring power on, uh, at, at that uh, time as well uh, for their local circuits outage. So basically um, a week before the, um, the uh, storm, the, all the cognizant uh, parties for electricity generation uh, uh, delivery have been uh, aware of this condition and were actively preparing their system as much as possible for that. So what happened, we know that the snowfall, snowfall uh, started on Saturday afternoon and gradually coming into Sunday, which was Valentine's Day, and it was really bad snowfall. And on Sunday, ERCOT started to request their customer, um, especially industry customers to perform energy conservation. And they witnessed uh, the winter peak demand at 69 gigawatts. What is feel like? So typically our demand peak happens in summer and the, throughout ERCOT system, the historic peak demand is around 75 uh, gigahertz, uh, gigawatts. So this, Sunday evening demand was almost like the hottest day in the summer. It was really stressful for the system. But then they were able to call in energy conservation from their big industry customers and also uh, um, actively uh, requesting uh, generation to produce electricity. So they, they were able to handle that 69 gigawatts demand and here everything started to collapse um, mid at midnight of Monday, February 15. They uh, knew about the shortage of supply or generation at midnight and at, um, they sent out announcement of emergency, energy emergency alert EEA at um, um, midnight and shortly after they started to the highest level of emergency alert EEA3 and asked the utilities to do rotating um, outages. They had to cut off 10 gigawatts of load at that moment and their findings, um, they knew that extreme weather conditions caused many generating units across few types to chip offline and become avail unavailable. Um, later on, they estimated that there was totals of 34 gigawatts of generation that have been forced off the system. So we will look into that timeline after the emergency EEA3 later on. Um, at, on Thursday or Friday of that week, conditions started to improve and they were able to gradually restore a majority of customers and ended the emergency condition. So this is what uh, the actual demand that was experienced in our code system and also with the dashed line and denoting the projected demand. So they actually projected that there would be a 70, almost actually going over 75 gigawatts of demand uh, in the morning of Monday, February 15 and that exceeded the hottest day, the, the worst summer peak demand that we had in ERCOT system. So why do we have winter de uh, peak demand? We know that in summer, when it's really hot, everyone turns on air conditioning uh, cooling systems, and that's why we have summer peak demand. In the winter, um, the same thing related to temperature half of Texas homes use electricity for heating and also for cooling, uh, sorry, for cooking as well. So when there's very low temperature, everyone started to use heating. So they expected that this is gonna be the same um, stressful uh, uh, energy electricity demand uh, for the whole system. And that's why they were expecting this winter demand. So 
um, from uh, here, you see that starting from midnight, the demand actually went down, uh, staying, uh, staying around 44 gigawatts level because uh, we, uh, they did the control outages. They started to ask the utilities to do um, uh, uh, rotating blackouts. And that is why we were having the 44 gigawatts instead of the projected 75. But before that, on um, uh, Sunday, they projected very high consumption. And that was the time also in the evening, the highest 69 gigawatts of winter demand when it happens. So I'm just uh, I'm uh, using the car as an example to um, kind of describe what that uh, event uh, means. So when we have peak demand for power system, it's like our car is climbing a very deep up here. It needs a lot of uh, power um, to supply uh, to uh, um, go up here. Well, when the generation went offline, it's like losing half of our horsepower, half of the engines for our power for our car. Because uh, in looking at the ballpark number is 34 gigawatts out of 75 gigawatts of what we need. So it's almost like we were losing half of the engines. But I would like to uh, also relate that to losing two out of our four tires because we know that when we uh, have a tire, flat tire problem, we will uh, we'll use our backup tire that can temporarily relieve the emergency, get us to a mechanics or someone to help um, until we are able to uh, restore the uh, flat tire. However, if we lost two tires, there is very unlikely that we are able to have that backup capability to handle the two flat tires. Especially what happens is that due to the cold weather, all across all system wide, the, um, uh, the generation has experienced the same uh, weather condition. So that means that our back tire also was flat. And that was um, the kind of condition um, 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 has happened. Uh, with the, the car example. So we will also look into why the back tire has also become flat during this uh, situation. So uh, why the generation went offline? So we knew that is due to the extreme cold weather. A majority of generation plants in Texas are not prepared for this temperature going uh, under zero uh, Fahrenheit. So we all have experienced how cold it had been in the last week, starting from um, Sunday. Um, and this is unprecedented uh, cold temperature for, uh, uh, um, for Texas. And uh, it is also the case that when that polar vortex came, it hit the majority of mid-continent of US, uh, United States, and all our neighboring states were uh, also experiencing that unprecedented level of low temperature. So the generation plants, uh, they don't have the kind of capability to, um, they didn't prepare their insulators or their steam pipes or water pipes to withstand that level of cold temperature and they had to uh, go offline. And that was the case um, across all types of generation as we will see re very soon. So in particular for natural gas plants, there was also the issue for uh, related to gas supply. So the gas uh, production wells were frozen and so, was, uh, so were the gas pipelines. And in, uh, in particular, uh, the gas supply has always been prioritized uh, for other needs for heating our homes, um, for example, because uh, many of us have used gas uh, furnace for heating as well. So the gas delivery company, they need to ensure that these homes using gas for heating have enough gas. So which as a result, the gas supply for um, uh, the gas plants has declined as well. And uh, the gas price went, uh, uh, price went up significantly for the same reason. 
so it, in particular for gas uh, plants, there was some issue for uh, at the um, in the supply side. I don't have the exact number yet, but we should uh, should know uh, after the investigation is over. So let's look at the um, generation uh, uh, that went uh, offline in terms of the capacity. So according to the public announcement by ERCOT, 28 gigawatts of thermal plants, which includes coal, gas, and nuclear plants, uh, went, uh, were not uh, able to uh, become uh, um, uh, being online. And that is equivalent to around 30 Seven percent, or one third of the total of the capacity of uh, uh, the thermal generation. So, one nuclear plant uh, in uh, South Texas nuclear power plant, um, one of the reactor had feed water issues, so it has to be shut had to be shut down, and we lost one point three gigawatts from nuclear side. And um, for the uh, gas and coal facility, that was spread almost everywhere across the state. So this was a huge loss for the system. And uh, we know that uh, we, sh uh, we shut down probably around 20 gigawatts of, uh, actually at the beginning was 10 gigawatts um, of load immediately. And that was around like half of this level of uh, thermal uh, insufficiency. So what about renewables? So there were a lot of discussions on that, but I still want to give you just the numbers that we know yet. For wind of solar, the official number they have in ERCOT announcement was 18 gigawatts compared to a total of 26 gigawatts uh, capacity, installed capacity, meaning all possible solar uh, utility scale, large solar farms and wind farms. So among that, we have 22 gigawatts, 23 gigawatts of wind and this, uh, around 2.5 gigawatts of solar farms. So it seems to be a huge number compared to the total capacity. But I would like to point out that the utility or ERCOT, they knew about the fact that in winter times, the so winter solar are not are never going to reach these 26 gigawatts. In their winter peak planning, they have planned for um, at most of 10 gigawatts in total from wind, of solar, uh, wind of, uh, and solar. So what does that mean? It means that they expected wind of solar based on historic data, like they used data from 2013 or 14, looking at different regions like Panhandle or coast or different areas in Texas, they knew that wind on average could only have around 20% to 40% of wind farms could become available in the winter time. So when they do their planning for the winter peak demand, they only counted um, at most 10 gigawatts of uh, uh, electricity from wind or solar. So we will take a closer look on that um, from these resources, uh, from this uh, links that uh, you have seen here. So um, in Texas, we have around 50% of electricity in terms of both capacity and energy production from natural gas plants. And 20% of that is from wind and another 15 to 18% from coal. And that's just some, ball, some number uh, based on the most recent uh, data that ERCO has uh, uh, um, uh, has uh, uh, collected. So when ERCO does planning for their winter peak, as you can see from this table here, so this is an example of how they uh, plan their system looking at their generation uh, adequacy and look at all possible um, uh, capacity that they have for different fuel types. They do this every season and also every year on uh, all possible uh, generation uh, sources. As, um, so when they do that for the winter, uh, for in the winter peak time, they have counted uh, only 10% of the winter peak um, from wind and solar. And that is uh, around like 10 gigawatts as we saw in the number in last slide. 
So if you look at the percentage here, this is what they are counting on based on historic data, how much uh, wind farm uh, could become uh, uh, available during the wind condition. So it's around 20% to 40%. So they expected that wind generation would have low output in the winter season, similar for solar as well. However, what they were uh, planning as well was that the thermal plants, um, coal, gas, and nuclear, when winter peak happens, they could become available with 100% of, uh, of their capacity. And that sums up to be around uh, 76 gigawatts of capacity, which is um, at the level of the peak demand that we uh, had uh, predicted for the Monday morning uh, uh, peak demand. So when utility does these plannings, they assume low uh, wind production, but then they didn't expect is that the solar plants can, would also become unavailable during uh, if we, we had very, very extreme uh, cold condition. That was the uh, missing link in their capacity uh, calculation. So, um, um, so in so I I I don't want to like talk um, like give more. I I don't have so a lot of people have been talking about scheduled outages of their uh, thermal plants. I don't have that number yet from uh, the public resources that I look up, but I knew that when um, looking at their uh, emergency alert or their preparation announcement to their generation units uh, a week before um, the storm, they were requesting every uh, thermal plants, every generation basically to become available if they could. So they were actively calling all the generation to become available for those ones who, who can become uh, online. However, the uh, low temperature has affected a system-wide um, out offline of the generation. So even if basically we have like 50% or I, I should say like a third of the thermal generation were unable to produce because they cannot uh, start their um, turbine, uh, gas turbines or steam turbines under this cold condition. So if we had to plan for that with this one third uh, probability of failure, then that was a lot of additional uh, uh, generation capacity we should have planned for, but um, this was not possible uh, without uh, knowing that these one third of uh, thermal plants would fail during this extreme cold condition. So uh, if you are interested, um, the uh, US uh, Energy Information Administration or EIA has uh, this actual generation output uh, by, uh, by source for all different types of generation sources uh, over the last week. So um, you can see that on Sunday when the, when the um, peak demand 69 gigawatts of peak demand happens, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the gas uh, plants have been trying to um, out produce, uh, like produce as much as possible to meet that 69. Um, uh, gigawatts uh, peak demand on Sunday evening, and so was the wind. They were um, producing almost to 10 gigawatts at that moment, because they were still able to do that, because uh, they still haven't the frozen, um, the frozen uh, temperature per se. Um, however, when, when the uh, cold weather, uh, sorry, when the midnight uh, clouds happened, there was a big drop of the gas production and the wind has gradually come down as well because there were also um, weather issue 
sorry, the uh, uh, issue of wind turbine has to be, uh, be stopped. And coal has also gradually dropped. It has also this sudden drop, as you can see from uh, this 1 a.m. Uh, time. And the nuclear plant lost this 1.3 gigawatts um, around um, Monday uh, early morning. Uh, so throughout Monday uh, during the day, solar has been actively uh, was actively producing. Um, I guess we had a sunny day on the Monday uh, right after the storm. So the solar production was almost three uh, gigawatts, which is very high compared to its installed capacity. Uh, however, there were also more and more uh, job of um, gas and coal and wind generation during the day of uh, Monday and when we went uh, enter, uh, went into Tuesday, uh, we had a worst uh, peak outage um, because of this gradually shutdown of all the uh, generation plants across from these sources. So that was around uh, the time, uh, or this is what the actual data, the actual generation output uh, from different sources that you can see uh, uh, from the uh, EIA, uh, 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 website. So this is the link that you can uh, go out to look here. So uh, based on this, uh, I have uh, uh, I calculated around some ballpark numbers on the actual uh, the, the job of production from these sources. Um, so it was just uh, based on how I look at uh, the data. You can, if you go to the website, you can have uh, seen the exact number uh, pre and post uh, this uh, Monday midnight uh, time mark. Um, so I think uh, um, I can uh, pause here if there were, if there are some questions. Um, so this is um, the place where I had all the data looking into what is the actual generation uh, decline uh, in ERCOT system so far. Uh, Professor, I have a question. Yes. Yeah, uh, so when this disaster happened last week, so uh, initially the blame is on mostly on wind turbine. It was termed as massive wind turbine failure. Uh, though uh, at that you can understand that that is not true, but still uh, maybe we have to admit that many wind turbines were shut down because of this IC condition. So yes. my, yeah, uh, so my question is like in places like, uh, take example of Iowa where average temperature is much, much lower than Texas. Yeah, yeah that's, a, that's a great point. So you're absolutely right that we should attribute the failure or the offline of generation across uh, all, all sources. It's not just a single source. Um, different generation plants have experienced this uh, impact of the cold weather condition. So why it didn't happen in other regions? This is because um, there are possible solutions to withstand that, uh, withstand the low temperature, extreme low temperature condition. However, in Texas, uh, the, our natural gas plants, our coal plants, all the wind turbines are not equipped with such solution in general. So they, ca they can handle maybe five or to 10 Fahrenheit, but then this freezing temperature uh, sorry, it's not just freezing, but this zero Fahrenheit temperature is so extreme that they are not able to uh, withstand that um, low temperature. Yeah, uh, not only on this natural gas or cold, uh, can we do something in uh, some kind of weathering in wind turbine also? Yeah, we, we, we will see more. So I was just presenting so far is what we have seen actually from the data. So from now on, I'm going to talk more about what actually is, um, there are different opinions about whom to, uh, uh, to blame or what could we have done. So I'm gonna at least share what I have thought about has happened. Yeah, thanks for the question. So I'm gonna move on maybe to uh, the, the next part. 
on okay. what exactly should uh, should we look at? How should we invest? Look at this event so far. Okay. So as you uh, many of you may have seen, a lot of people blame ERCOT for that. Um, so let me just first clarify what is the role of ERCOT. ERCOT is what we call the Independent System Operator or ISO. Its role is to balance supply and demand. So we know that in power system, um, it's, it, um, uh, it's very important to balance the supply, uh, uh, the supply to meet demand. As a customer, a majority of the demand is still uh, inflexible. So we determine how much we need. And when we turn on the lights, we turn on our appliance. And it's the job of the ISO or ERCO to look at how much demand we need. And they actually uh, act actively communicate that to the generation plans to say that, oh, you, you guys need to prepare. There's going to be a high demand. So you need to stay online. And you, also they would save some for like a reserve, which is like a backup in case the demand exceeds the expected level or in case there's some failures on the generation, a small percentage of failures on the actual generation here. So this is kind of the reserve is what you can think of as a backup tire. So, um, the other job of ERCOD is to manage the flow of electricity. So when the uh, power is produced, is not directly at uh, the place of where it's consumed or the uh, population center. So another important job of ERCOD is coordinate with the transmission um, uh, line, uh, lines or the uh, uh, delivery system to make sure that there is uh, uh, the power can be delivered from the source of production to the, uh, uh, the demand with good safety and reliability. So ERCOT covers the majority of Texas uh, load and the majority of Texas land, except for uh, the El Paso area or Panhandle area and also the East Texas area. So there was a total of very large number of transmission lines that is actively monitoring to ensure that the power can be safely and reliably delivered from the generation to the demand. So as we know that the immediate cause of this event is insufficient generation, um, uh, online generation. So I would like to point out that ERCOT does not own any of the generation units. They have the generation you they cannot mandate yes. the generation to weatherize throughout the event. So it is up to the generation units decision as to what level of um, uh, weatherization uh, procedures that they should implement. And um, the other um, fact is that when the system was under high stress on Sunday evening, when there was 69 gigawatts of peak demand, Erco was successful in calling on the generation to produce and also successful in managing the flow of electricity in the network. So they were sa uh, uh, safely uh, delivered on this massive uh, transmission network. So that speaks to their capability. Even in the hot uh, summer, as Professor Badi mentioned that if they have, we have like 65 gigawatts of demand in the hottest summer day, that was still managed well by ERCOT, at least in the past summers. So I don't believe that ERCOT as a single, uh, uh, independent system operator is to be blamed for this massive failure of generation plans, especially if that's not, uh, they cannot have the power to oversight, um, provide oversight to the generation plans. So what about the electricity market that was run in ERCOT? I think a lot of you have seen the news that the wholesale electricity market went up around uh, $9,000 per megawatt hour. And that is uh, 
almost 300 times of the typical rate of wholesale electricity price. So this is a figure showing how uh, the wholesale electricity price in the red line here uh, changes um, in uh, around this week uh, associated with the increase of gas price uh, as well. So this $9,000 uh, uh, per megawatt hour price is a price cap. And it was uh, part of what's called a scarcity market mechanism that has been um, proposed by uh, energy economics uh, expert. Um, if you're interested, you can look at this paper here. So uh, the goal here is to say that, oh, if we, so this price cap, what does it mean? It means that whenever the system has to um, uh, disconnect certain loads, then the price will be kept on this um, maximum cap here. So they believe that this way, whenever there's some emergency and then the price is so high, then the generators would be incentivized to put in investment to make sure that they are able to uh, produce electricity during such emergency condition. However, as we all know, it didn't work in the past week because all the generators, if they could, they would definitely want to produce electricity to uh, take advantage of this really high electricity price, but then they simply didn't have the capability to do so. So, um, so it didn't seem to, it didn't work to incentivize generators to prepare for such extreme low uh, temperature condition so that they can take advantage of this uh, high price uh, here. Um, so if you know about electricity markets, some people uh, talked about also that ERCA does not have a capacity market, which seem to be better uh, to handle this emergency um, uh, condition. But, um, I be, uh, a lot of us also believe that, I mean, oh, it should be a fact that even if we had a capacity market, um, we cannot handle this loss of half of generation or almost one third of generation. So back to the car example, what is a capacity market? Is like you pay a lot of, most of generators, they are paid for the actual electricity that they produce. If we have, have a capacity market, it's like you are paying some generators to be there as the backup tire. They don't actually, they don't need to produce electricity, but then they are staying online in case that there are some failures so they can quickly uh, become available to produce electricity. Um, so they are paid for being there, but not necessarily produce electricity. So, um, yeah, so the bottom line here is that if we have such a high level of loss of uh, generation, we can we simply cannot have to uh, had expected that and paid another set of generation to be the backup, especially thinking about that this low temperature would affect everyone. So even if we had the backup, they would not be able to produce as well. So they would not be able to fulfill the role of the backup as well. So the general um, belief here is that these kind of long-term investment to handle this very, very extreme, like one in decades of scenario cannot simply be incentivized from the market economics. So this long-term investment um, has to, um, for the weatherization plans, has to um, come from other type of uh, uh, regulation uh, 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 practices. So, I so in general, I we uh, we don't think that if ERCA has implemented a different type of market or changed their market mechanism, it can, could have totally prevented this blackout. Okay, so what about interconnection? So many of you probably heard that we have independent tax grid and uh, this is part from the uh, independence transition that we have in Texas. This uh, independence uh, mindset is so ingrained into our minds like when we had our son for uh, was 
just three months, we couldn't wait to put on a Texas flag onesie on him, just to feel so um, to make him to share this Texas proud spirit that we all feel here. So a lot of people blame that if the Texas grid was connected to um, the rest of the US power system, then um, they believe that if we are better connected, then this could have been pre uh, prevented. So I uh, want to uh, let you know that ERCOD, uh, so many of you have seen this article. So ERCOD was formed in the 1970s as an ISO. So it does compile with uh, NERC, which is North American Electric Reliability Corporations. Uh, 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 this is the largest um, reliability uh, regulation entity in the North America. So uh, it does compile with the reliability standards for uh, the nationwide reliability standards, but it's not subject to FERC, which is the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, um, which is the regulator for the US federal government in, on the energy side. So, um, so it does have some, uh, uh, it does uh, have the reliability, uh, uh, it does meet the reliability uh, standards from, uh, uh, from, from NERC. So in general, interconnections or having all the grades interconnected together, it does encourage efficiency and reliability, that's for sure. But interconnection comes with a price. It is costly to construct transmission lines and takes years. And it also would have a lot of discussions because we just simply don't want to have a transmission line in our backyard or in our neighborhood. So there are a lot of different um, issues related to uh, build, building transmission lines. Just to let you know that when we, uh, um, two decades ago, when we try to move uh, or connect all the wind generation from West Texas to the population centers in Central Texas, we had the competitive renewable energy uh, zone or CIEZ transmission uh, line construction project. It cost around uh, $7 billion to um, build those transmission lines that br uh, brought 20 gigawatts of wind generation to central, uh, to the population, uh, um, uh, to the population um, centers in Texas. So it is costly and has a lot of different uh, issues related to building transmission lines. In addition, uh, interconnection could also make some system uh, to be vulnerable to external failures. This is like a domino effect, meaning like a train effect. If a failure happens in one part of it interconnection, it can propagate to other parts of interconnection. That happened in 2003 in northeast part of US. Well, uh, local, uh, well, uh, transmission line failure in Ohio area propagated all the way to New York, New England, and even into Canada as well. And that was also part of the reasons for the uh, 2011 Southwest blackout, where a transmission line connecting Arizona and uh, California failed and or had issue, uh, angular, uh, angular stability issue, and that has caused the blackout in the whole San Diego area as well. So um, I just want to mention these uh, pros and cons with related to interconnection, but let's look into that whether it could have been, the interconnection could have prevented ERCOT to withstand this specific event in the last week. So you have seen earlier that when the polar vortex, this winter storm came, it came affected the whole of mid continent of USA. And our neighboring area, Southwest Power Pool, SPP and mid continent ISO, MISO, were experiencing the same historic or record low temperature and snowfall level. So accordingly, their system have experienced the same stress of high demand and also uh, in particular in, um, uh, in SPP, a lot of generation natural gas uh, were not able to produce 
as well for the same reason as, uh, as uh, the ERCOD generations. So these were the, uh, the information provided at, at a recent IEEE webinar. So SPP system was under supply and so was our neighbors in North Mexico was under supply. And MISO was almost maxed out. So this part was not able to help us. There were around four to six gigawatts of reserve here in the west part um, of interconnection. And so this was definitely very little compared to the amount of generation that we lost, which was in the level of 30, um, 34 gigawatts. So even if we were better connected to our immediate neighbors, we couldn't have prevented this immediate, this initial shock that we had. So it, where were uh, there, well, could there be actual electricity? There was some in the East Coast, but you can see from this geographic view here that we, had, we, ha we would have no way to be able to connect to this actual uh, electricity in the East Coast. So we believe that even if had ERCOT been better connected to the rest of the US interconnections, this particular shortage, uh, significant shortage of generation could not have been mitigated uh, by um, transferring power from our neighbor uh, specifically for the last week's event. So this is uh, almost uh, being uh, uh, agreed by many people uh, in the industry. I would also want to mention that we are actually connected uh, to our neighbors. We have two high voltage DC tie lines with our neighbors in the north and three high voltage DC tie lines with our neighbors uh, with uh, Mexico and the Mexico grid is actually in the, uh, from the Mexico grid, we are indirectly connected to the Western uh, interconnection or the West part of uh, United States power grid because Mexico is also connected uh, to the uh, California power grid uh, in, uh, in uh, when they, um, when their boundary meet, where their boundary meets. So these five HVDC tie lines uh, sum up to uh, around 1.1 gigawatts of capacity. That's not a lot, of course. So it's very tiny compared to the 34 gigawatts that we lost. However, when the snow storm hit our neighbors, they also um, decrease the amount of import that they gave to us on these uh, high voltage DC highlights. So this is again from EIA is the amount of electricity interchange on these uh, two uh, connections. So the blue one is with Mexico and then the uh, brown one is from uh, SPP, uh, the Oklahoma uh, uh, tie lines. And the negative value is the import here. So we were almost importing at, uh, at the capacity, uh, but when, uh, um, when during uh, Monday, Friday, uh, February 15, um, our neighbors decreased the import because they were experiencing their same uh, blackout uh, for the same reason that we were having uh, the power outages. So I just want to mention that this is showing that the same thing that uh, uh, we, sure, uh, we showed in the last slide, if we were able to uh, better connect to the neighbors here in the north and south, they simply don't have the capacity to give us extra power uh, that uh, because they were experiencing um, the uh, under supply issue as well. So uh, um, the last thing I want to mention is, um, is a lot of people saying about the federal regulations because we were not part of uh, 
the East and Western connection. So we are not under, a lot of people believe we were not under federal regulations. So federal regulation, US Congress only authorized FERC to do annual or seasonal assessment on generation adequacy. This is similar to the winter planning that we had, uh, uh, the paper that you have seen earlier to look at how the generation capacity uh, compared to the total, um, the maximum demand that we're expecting. So ERCOT is already doing that. For NERC, so ERCOT does compile uh, comply with NERC standards. NERC requires what's called MN1 reliability. That's like losing one line or unit. This is far from enough for this event. And according to um, uh, communications with Professor Bodic, um, ERCOT actually is better than MN1. It's able to handle the outages, the simultaneous outages uh, at the level of two nuclear plants, which is almost four gigawatts. So ERCOT that have the capability to handle these or exceeds the level of these standards. What is missing here, as you are seeing, is this generation adequacy assessment. It is actually up to each state regulators to develop or look into our own generation adequacy assessment in terms of regarding to special events or extreme conditions or disasters. And in Texas, this is the job of Public Utility Commission, PUC Texas. And that would be where the jurisdiction or regulation would come from. Um, so a lot of people believe that we should have done that, especially because that the same events ha happened in 2011. And also um, many years ago in 1989, so in 2011, it's uh, the same cause, the low temperature, and uh, there was shortage of generation uh, from thermal plants, and also electric utilities couldn't maintain the service because of local circuits uh, 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 breakdown issues. So there was similar rolling uh, blackouts. So after that, there was a NERC uh, FERC and NERC joint report, which points out that the generators were not being proactive in their approach. And they point out that the single largest problem is the cold weather events. And they encourage that all the cognizant uh, parties like uh, the transmission operators and generator, uh, generation on owners to prepare for this winter uh, season as critical as preparation for our summer peak. So a lot of people say that we would, or I guess many of us would believe, would say that if we have implemented that suggestions as a, coming from a state regulation, then this will be at least having less amount or percentage of thermal generation going offline this time. I, I, I'm not an energy policy person, so I don't have um, the information on why this didn't happen, but I would want to say that to my knowledge, like even in like cold states like Wisconsin that I just found out the information today that the states don't have this type of regulation either. It is simply because that they were expecting cold weather. So the generator, generation owners, they actively prepare themselves for these events. It's not coming from a state regulation in uh, like say a Midwest state. So I don't have the full uh, uh, investigation on that, but then uh, yeah, I, I don't know any states have done that kind of regulation um, uh, in the United States. Okay, so with that, I would want to go to what I will, oh, a lot of us believe what has triggered to this system-wide failure. So the immediate cause is the extreme cold weather. But fundamentally, it's because when we design power grids, like most of all civilian infrastructure that we have, we design them to withstand random local or small scale failures, or like a more possible, possible, uh, um, more possible failure uh, scenarios. And this can be like going to, um, any infrastructure networks 
or like uh, any engineering systems that we own. So it is based on very uh, detailed analysis with the cost benefit trade-off in mind and using uh, stochastic uh, risk models investigating what is the risk of certain things happens. And given that this is the risk that we can afford, how do we best manage all limited resource uh, resources that we have to make sure our system won't fail under these more high, uh, high, uh, more likely failure events. So that's the same thing like our homes were not designed to make sure that water pipes won't break um, for 72 hour uh, freezing temperature. Well, the same thing happened in 2011, but I don't know how much that has affected the building construction codes or standards in Texas to make sure that this um, won't happen again. And in the same way that I'm uh, Austin transplant for four years, like I drive an all wheel drive car, but I, I'm sure that after 2011, it doesn't make that more people to prefer to have an all wheel drive car in case there is a big snowstorm and then these cars are more reliable during these events. So it's just, it's still like what the engineering system design philosophies what, uh, are in general. But should, would that be the best thing we should take? It's definitely not, because as we can see that if we overlook these factors that have global impact, think like this natural disaster, this extreme cold weather, if we overlook these very unlikely events, then they will have the uh, catastrophic outcomes. And these kind of events in it's called can be called like common mode failures that's usually used in aerospace systems. In power systems, we also call it high impact, low frequency events. So that could include natural disasters like winter storm, hurricanes, and even solar storms, which could affect it, um, a large portion of transformers in uh, some systems. And definitely well files that you can see from uh, California area. So these events, they have a common cause and or a common source of uh, uh, the cause. And then they could uh, all of a sudden affect a wide, very wide area of systems infrastructure that we have. And in general, many of our engineering or infrastructure systems are not designed to uh, uh, withstand these kind of common mode failures. So uh, in addition to natural disasters, there could also be like man-made uh, compromises like cyber attacks or electromagnetic pulse attacks as well. So there are also research on that. Um, the final messages is I would like to share some thoughts on what it means going forward, how we should future proof our system. So we do want to design our system in terms of looking by looking into these uh, common mode failures. In particular, the lesson here for this event is the extreme weather disasters originated from a changing climate uh, conditions. Um, so we do have witnessed more frequent occurrence of these kind of unexpected climate uh, weather conditions as like natural disasters. So we should proactively study for these events, especially using more recent uh, updated data or updated scenario analysis. And also we want to design the system with this massive failure in mind. If we knew that there could be a 50% of failure, how should we better design our system that can be more flexible or more resilient under this emergency condition? And that could involve uh, hardening our grid infrastructure uh, from generation transmission and distribution and also across all the interdependent systems like gas and water from uh, what you see that the, uh, the gas uh, supply was also an issue for a lot of uh, generation units. 
So maybe some immediate system-wide action, actions for ERCOD is to study for these climate change scenarios, look into what would be the possible scenarios uh, by consulting with experts in this area. The other thing is looking into the gas electricity coupling. So maybe they should look into the um, generation, uh, gas generation um, is not able to be 100% available because of this coupling. These kind of things is done, are done in like Northeast uh, system operators like in New England area. But uh, I, I don't know if it is uh, uh, yet considered in ERCOT system. And definitely in general, a weather a well capacity model, like looking into this seasonal assessment may not be sufficient. Maybe we should consider like this worst case assessment for each season as well. And the last thing is how do we enable this flexibility, maybe from a different type of energy storage and resources. This is a very hard problem because compared to the total demand, as you have seen 75 gigawatts, this level of flexibility uh, has to be very significant to meet um, um, this total system demand. And um, it will be a costly solution as well. But then going forward, that's definitely what we need for our uh, ever-changing system operation. The last thing that I have is on the local utility side. And this is particularly sad is what happened in Austin Energy when they were asked to um, do load shedding. Because their systems have so many or in Austin area, they have so many critical essential services like government buildings, hospitals, or police stations, or they have a majority of their circuits are called critical circuits. Meaning that as long as there is a government building or there is a hospital connected to this circuit, then they deem it to be critical and they didn't, uh, they didn't uh, disconnect or, or do an outage on these uh, circuits uh, at all. Um, I think um, most of these circuits were not uh, impacted. How, because of that, all their non-critical circuits, which is around 40% of their circuits, had, that, had to be without power for days because they just don't have the capability to cut 50% of their load without impacting the critical circuits. So what's the result of that is that many non-essential services like residential users or commercial users um, because simply because they were on the critical circuits, they were not impacted at all. And this could have been avoided if we have better sectionizing, basically a flexible reconfiguration of our system. So you can see this is a typical view of a uh, like a local utility distribution circuits. There are different types of customers or even some renewable generation on these circuits. So in definitely if they have installed enough like control points, they can disconnect certain type of customers without affecting uh, important essential service on their circuits. So they could have implemented a rolling blackouts among all residential users if there was better sectionizing um, uh, capability at Austin Energy. And this was definitely uh, an immediate action item, I believe, for our local utility uh, di distribution uh, systems. The second part is maybe we can have more automatic load control. So what during the conservation notice happened is was sent out was a so social media or some news channels to everyone. But if we have some automatic mechanism to make sure that non-essential use in our household like washer dryer or our um, uh, like um, non-critical needs at residential homes can be automatically disconnected. And that could also help 
to better implement uh, emergency energy conservation uh, 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 alert as well. So with that, uh, uh, I would like to end the talk and thank you all for coming today. And what is the message here? Um, I, I pray that I don't have a single answer on the solution going forward other than that there is a significant overlook on these extreme weather events on our infrastructure. I mean, due to our infrastructure designing principle philosophy here. And we hope that we will learn from this lesson and we hope that we will be better prepare our system um, going forward. So um, that's uh, all I have for uh, this. And sorry for going over time. And I see there are some uh, questions uh, from the chat. Um, so uh, uh, I think, uh, um, yeah, if you want to uh, have, yeah, so there was a, a news article about Texas grid was seconds and minutes away from having blackout for months. And this could happen if uh, ERCOT was not immediately disconnecting of having this load shedding principle, basically cutting off a third of the load um, that they have. If that didn't wasn't done immediately, we could go to a system-wide blackout and it will take a lot of time because there will be um, assets damaged and, this, and they need to be replaced and it will take an even longer time to go back to a normal uh, conditions. Yes, I, I will record, uh, sorry, I will post uh, this recording um, if you're interested. And so, yeah, I don't know any changes have happened uh, since 2011 so far. I, I believe um, ERCOT um, um, definitely have made sure that their transmission systems are better uh, prepared for this event. As we can see from um, this past week, there were no reporting that a transmission tower or transmission line had to be outaged or offline because they were destroyed. So I believe that um, there were better preparation on the transmission system. I don't know what has changed in the generation plan side. Um, yes, uh, natural gas pipelines and uh, turbines. So I believe uh, from what I read on the news article, there needs to be some self like defreezing uh, mechanisms um, that uh, or like the uh, insulation has to be specially designed to make sure that the plants can uh, uh, overcome this extreme low temperature. Um, So yeah, so I think the months long blackout uh, would be also uh, part of the failures uh, uh, from uh, transmission lines and transformers and also probably some, um, possibly some generators that were online at that time. If there's a off sudden a frequency drop down to below uh, 59.5, for example, then uh, that would damage system wide uh, uh, equipments uh, everywhere. So uh, uh, I think there was, uh, yeah, the plans for infrastructure upgrades. So yeah, still on this regulation side, um, yeah, it's very hard uh, in, uh, without to have this foresight um, yeah, it's very hard to um, kind of having the regulators to repel for these extreme rail events as well. That require like an extraordinary amount of foresight. And you can see there will be a lot of resistance from industry or from the people who've been reg regulated to try to um, just to maintain their cost so I, I made the example that, okay, um, yeah, um, we know that there could be a winter storm or snowstorm 
in um, Texas, how many of us are willing to change our car to an all wheel drive car um, or to have that uh, preparation for these weather events. So, I mean, I know that the car comparison is nothing to the lack of electricity, but when electricity is on, we would know, we, we don't feel that the lack of it is very, very, very bad. But then when it's off, that's when we start to know that this is an unacceptable scenario. So I believe that we do need to look into these issues. We do need to uh, look into this global impact. Um, should we regulate the generation plans? Um, I'm, again, I'm not an energy policy person, so I, I don't want to comment on that. But I believe that the grid infrastructure, the transmission distribution side, especially distribution, as we can see from Austin Energy, would want to prepare for this event. It's not acceptable that we don't have a plan that if we, we were Austin Energy is, I mean, I'm sure that they have that plan, but I'm just saying that it's not, it's not fair that to some customers that because they were not on uh, a critical circuits, they have to be without power for days. There is a solution for that, that we can handle 50% of load shedding if we had more control points on our circuits. So if we are able to shut down, um, like maintain only nonstop service to our important essential uh, us users like government building and hospitals, we could have a rolling blackout among all the Austin Energy residential users um, in a way. And that could be a more flexible and better prepared emergency uh, plan from the local utility side. So I, I do believe that from the power grid, power system infrastructure itself, we should look into all these uh, possibilities to allow for more flexibility and allow more preparedness to these extreme events to, um, I mean, today may be uh, a winter storm, but it may be also flooding hurricane tomorrow. So this constant uh, in, um, preparation or planning on our infrastructure would be a better solution to all these changing weather, uh, weather conditions or climate conditions. Um, so yeah, I know it's very late. Uh, if you have uh, any questions, I'm happy to answer. Um, yeah, so I can uh, post the recording on my uh, website uh, for everyone. Uh, Professor, I have one more question. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so talking about the interconnection, as you told, it will be cost the first year. But uh, as we know that Texas is very energy rich in terms of oil, natural gas, and even in renewables. So, uh, don't you think that it can make huge profit by selling the power to the neighboring states if we have that interconnected grid? And one more thought regarding that, like, uh, do we really had enough storage capacity this time? Like if we have the interconnection grid, then uh, if we want to sell power, maybe it will uh, encourage to increase the storage capacity. And maybe that will be immensely helpful for this kind of emergency situation. So what's your point on this? Yeah, so I totally agree with you that interconnection is good in general for power systems that allows for easy access of cheap electricity and allows more um, like people looking into different solutions. So, um, we, yes, if we had um, interconnection built, then yes, the generation here in Texas can also sell power to neighboring states. Um, I, I believe that it will in general uh, benefit the whole uh, 
customers, electricity users overall uh, in that sense. Um, still, it has to come with the discussion that um, where are we going to find the land to build the interconnections? And not to forget, there is also a geographic barrier that prevents us from building uh, transmission lines across certain regions. So for that reason, east and west interconnection are not uh, uh, are not connected together, as you know, because we have mountain areas between these uh, these border here. Um, so on your second part, the on the storage side, um, so still now in ERCOT planning, the storage capacity is not counted at all. They, kind of, they, they put like a zero number, I believe, in the storage side. Um, okay. I think, yes. So if say that we have more and more need for flex flexible resources driven by the market economics, I believe that would be a good incentive for storage. But if you're saying that we're installing storage to prepare for this very unlikely event, I, I don't think yeah. they would be profitable. So yeah. it's yeah, I think uh, that has to come with some kind of uh, economic incentives for them to stay profitable in the system. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Any other questions? Yeah, Dr. Drew, I, I have a question regarding the transmission line, the interconnections as well. Um, so I just wondering, um, is there a plan, that ongoing plan for the, uh, not only in Texas, but also across the whole nation? Um, is there a plan that they have something to do with the ultra, uh, ultra high voltage transmission lines that, they, yeah. uh, that China yeah. has been doing? So, Very good question. So. Um, I would like to refer you to a study done by National Renewable Energy Lab, NREL, on the <laughs> east and west interconnection ties. So they did a study on that and they feel that uh, by connecting the two east and west system, they could encourage uh, more renewable access. Um, so there was a study on that and they have a published report on it. So um, yeah, you should be able to find it online. If not, let me know. Uh, but in specifically for ERCOT system, they, it, there is also a plan to build transmit uh, high voltage lines here to better connect with the West part of neighbors. I, I, I don't have the exact uh, I, uh, number on when this is, uh, when the plan uh, is gonna, uh, what's the status of this uh, connection here on the West side. So what do you think is like, because uh, um, the US is, I, I don't know, I think China is the lead of building the high transmission power line across the whole nations in the world now. What do you think is the main barrier like stopping uh, United States to build those transmission lines? Um, so uh, again, I'm not a energy per policy person. From my understanding, it has to do with one is this is a long-term planning decision and there has to be a strong will from like a top down level that everyone from the top uh, uh, from the top and everyone would every one of us would want to have this kind of project so in um, when, when Texas had the competitive renewable energy zone project basically building transmission lines from West Texas to Central Texas to allow wind access. There was a very, very long discussion and a, a very long-term planning that cost a lot of money to make sure that it happened. Um, so it just has to do with a lot of long-term planning um, mm -hmm. in building transmission lines. So some kind of uh, uh, market mechanism or some kind of um, political structures may not be amenable to this type of long-term planning, I would say. Um, but in general, it's just coming from this difficulty that we have 
to have a lot of long-term planning to build transmission lines. Thank you. Yes. Any other questions? Okay, yeah, if not, um, uh, thank you all for coming today. Um, yeah, I'd be happy to, I will post the uh, slides and also the recording on my website. And uh, you can also uh, um, um, contact me via email. Uh, I will try to respond uh, as much as possible. And thank you all for your attention. And um, I hope you uh, continue to stay well. Uh, thank you. Bye. Thank you, Professor. Thanks. Thank you, Professor. Thank, thank you. you, Professor. Thank you.